Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. I am tired of the functional. I am spent with logic and reason. I think we should all spend our time in a way that is completely fruitless, aside from its contingency to induce rapture. It appears to me that the less applied our time is, the less our curiosities imbue some kind of practicality, the closer we get to an experience of the sublime, a singularly special sensation that pullulates inwardly without witness. Hobbies are exactly that. They're activities or excursions that we do for ourselves and for no one else for no other reason than self-satisfaction. They are not done for money, for inclusion, for recognition. These interests are harrowing cries of the soul, cries that increase in their disturbance if they are not catered to. We should yield to these cries. We should indulge in them. If something comes of our hobbies, whether that is wealth or success or fame, that is welcome, but it's definitely not the initial aim. It shouldn't be. And we should hope, despite this newfound recognition, that our integrity remains intact, that we simply just continue on as before. I believe wholeheartedly in the value of useless things. I have faith in our capacity to comprehend that value can be applied to the external world as well as the inner world. My focus here is on the latter. I want to encourage endeavors that bring you a private joy a secret that isn't shared with anyone else, a hobby that does not pose to get you ahead in life, but furthers the development of the soul, which I would say is a goal that is far more important than any kind of success in society. If you're able to achieve a balance, though, within yourself and the external world, doing whatever you're doing, achieving a kind of success or wealth without losing your integrity, then of course more power to you. But also make sure not to ever get down on yourself because you do not achieve anything from whatever it is you're taking pleasure in. So here I have a very long list of hobbies that I think fall under such criteria. On this list are curiosities that keep the mind busy and have the propensity for continuous evolution, meaning that they can be lifelong obsessions. So let us proceed, shall we, on suggestions for how to waste your time. Number one is collecting. Collecting of any kind. Perfume bottles, stamps, records, old books, whatever it may be. Collecting things has been done for status before. It has been done to achieve a kind of personal value. It has been done so that you can preserve the past. Uh, antique collectors are very good examples of this. I actually knew people that were, and their house was kind of like a museum of artifacts from the past. But they did this not because it brought them any kind of status. They did it because whenever their friends came along and they kind of hung out at the house, they did this so that they could share the experience, the beauty with other people. And while this was obviously done as a way to share beauty with other people, the act of collecting itself, the searching, the seeking for these items, the putting of sometimes obnoxious amounts of money down to acquire these objects, that is done unobserved and in solitude. Collecting to me seems very romantic because it's kind of like gathering up things that will be forgotten if not held on to, which I really like. Also, it's one of those kinds of harmless, unhinged obsessions that is not normally accepted in any other part of society. No one seems to, to find it absurd or ridiculous, the collecting of objects. If anything, it inspires awe. Music and attending concerts. This is a common one, but I respect it despite that. I love people that go to concerts. People who go to concerts consistently, like every single week, as much as they possibly can, multiple times a week going to venues simply for the atmosphere and not because they want to see one particular musician. I respect the hell out of that. They, some of these people who are, who are obsessed, like they just kind of go to be in the middle of the smoke and the lights and the electric cords and the speakers. They kind of feel feral in that area. Those people are truly something because when you go to venues, when you go to concerts, it's one of the few times where you can actually be in 
a very, very artistic, atmospheric space. A space that can often transport you completely. Music is one of those old kind of Dionysian things where you can kind of, where you can entirely just lose yourself in an atmosphere. You can forget your body. There's something very, very archaic about that feeling. And of course, these people are obsessed with discovering new music. It's all they care for. And I think that's, that's really something special. Perfumes. Learning about perfumes. We don't really need perfume or cologne period. This is definitely a useless hobby to pursue the knowledge about perfumes as well as collecting perfumes. Perfumes are really just artificial pheromones that are more detectable and obvious to us than actual pheromones. But really they are, they are just so special. There really is, I'm personally my, myself a kind of blooming perfume head as they call it. It is such a fascinating subject to get into, especially if you have a passion for chemistry. I've also noticed that this obsession with perfume has a very strong kind of cult following to it, mostly on the internet. Perfume is one of those very special pursuits because perfume is very ephemeral. The scent itself, perfume is very relative to everyone um, and it's very mercurial in nature. Perfume changes, it degrades over time. Scent changes over time with different demographics and different cultures, preferences for certain smells. I know a lot of people who talk about uh, the difference between perfumes in the 80s and the 90s, how drastically different they were. Learning about perfume really and simple is just trying to to figure something out and then once you finally figured it out it's already gone learning calligraphy what is more useless than stylizing your handwriting really i don't think this one really needs much explanation but all we need to do really is to communicate what's in here to another person that's the most useful thing in the world that's the most functional thing it's the most helpful thing in the world and we can do this if we are not able to come into contact with somebody. We are able to do this through letters, through text message. We don't even have to write anymore, really. But instead, there are many people who choose to create a penmanship that exudes their personality or a, create a typography that, that has a feeling like to it. There are, of course, graphic design has an entire realm for typography and an entire discipline around it and how typography affects your psychological state, how you feel when you look at letters and how they're shaped. And it's learning calligraphy and how to, calligraphy is very specific, but um, I'm just saying that by handwriting because handwriting itself is already a lost art. No one really likes to write things down anymore. Mostly we're doing everything on our laptops and on our phones. I just think it's very useless and very wonderful and beautiful to personalize how you write or to, to make beautiful the letters that you write down on a page to give some character to whatever it is you're writing. I don't think there's anything better than that. Memorizing poetry. Memorizing poetry is one of these things too. Poetry in general is a useless and quite diseased discipline if you read in on it. A lot of poets have some serious, serious mental problems and statistically more so than any other creative discipline. But I've always found poetry to be kind of like a dialect. It's a kind of condensed way of speaking it's kind of condensed language. There's a refinement to it. I've always wanted to be able to speak only in poems, which is nearly impossible. But memorizing it, committing poetry to memory is, is almost like reciting prayers. But memorizing them, I've noticed, or listening to poetry, which I, I believe I'm going to be having a video on this. Memorizing poetry is kind of a way to, in, in the words of White Oleander, to protect yourself from the world's soft decay. It's a way to escape reality through beauty, through the refinement of the phrase, and through the structures of poetry. And just beautiful words that are kind of strung all together on a garland. Committing it to memory, one, is difficult. It's, it seems like a waste of time. There is really no real use for it, but it is, it is a remarkable hobby to have. Something to, a great way to waste your time. 
Ikebana and flower arrangement. This is a really great one. I actually got my mother for her birthday one year a very, very old vintage book from the 70s on Japanese Ikebana. And if you don't know what that is, it's, it's the art of flower arrangement. And you have these... I can't remember what they're called, but you have these kind of, I believe they used to be cast in iron and they have these spokes coming out of the bottom where you're able to place the stems of plants very specifically in distance from one another. And there is this very, very complicated hierarchy of how you're supposed to place plants and where you're supposed to cut them and which leaf to leave on and which flower to use with how they communicate with one another in in the structure of the vase and everything. It's, it's a really gorgeous art. It's a really great way to waste your time. Um, just because of how detailed everything is in practice and when you're learning about it. But flowers in general, keeping them in your home is the most unnatural thing that you can do. Flowers are supposed to be in the ground. They're not meant to be severed at the root and put in a vase filled with water where you just wait for them to die and wither. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, strive towards artifice. It's kind of the triumph of the human mind over the natural over mother nature. Writing letters and keeping stationary. Again, maybe not useless, but in today's technological age, this is not necessary at all, but it is wonderful. It is a purely kind gesture to sit down at a desk and to write a letter to somebody, even a note or a thank you note or whatever it may be, a card. But to do this by your own hand and to collect stationery, for your stationery to embody your personality, people know who you are, buy your stationery, that kind of thing, and to collect them, pieces of paper that are thicker than normal and they have this kind of eggshell feeling to them or they're embossed or whatever it may be. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's definitely a very rare and unique kind of gesture to receive something written on stationery, to receive a handwritten note or something like that. Not many people have that energy or that selflessness to sit down and write something sweet. It's almost, I would say that writing letters and receiving letters on stationery is a very sensual thing. Definitely a good one. Learning the scientific names for plants. <laughs> Unless you're a botanist, who do you, who needs to know the Latin names of plants? But they sure are pretty. I know two. I learned Papaver somniferum, which is the poppy plant, a long time ago because I was obsessed with poppies for a long time, and opium, and Aquaria melisensis, which is the name for agarwood, which produces fragrant fungus that is more valuable than gold in the perfume world. Also, Latin is a dying language and it is the root of almost all of our languages and we really need to revive it. It's a language filled with mysticism and romance and humor. And this is my plea that we not let it get buried. And I feel that some one of the easiest ways to just kind of subject yourself to the language is to learn the scientific names for plants. And they really are just, just beautiful. I love just seeing them written out, especially in like an old Roman script. But yeah, is it necessary? No. Is it fun? Yes. Is it a great way to waste your time? Yes. Reading. This is probably the most simple one on here and probably one that, that a I would say more than enough people do, but I still think that more people could do. Reading especially if it's fiction, especially if it's uh, some kind of esoteric history, is pure escapism. And that's it. It's the chance to enter the minds of others, to travel back into the past or catapult into the future. It's a great way to, to lose yourself. If you, don't, if you don't like alcohol, if you don't like drugs, just read a damn book. You'll get lost in that. I always... I always loved the, the haziness that you feel after reading a book, especially if you read on a break at work or before work or something like that, or before you have to do something like run an errand or do something important that requires more of your frontal cortex. You really just, you're stuck. You're like you're still in the book. You're still in whatever it is you were reading. You were almost embodying whatever time period is you were right, like reading about or you were kind of 
embodying the character that you're reading about. Reading is really, really special in that way. And in that kind of same vein, that kind of escaping, that escapism, I would say we're going to go into the next one, watching and studying films. Same kind of escapism, same kind of uselessness. It's really just done as a buffer, a way to kind of get lost in the details of writing. And not only that, but to appreciate the structure of a book, to appreciate the structure of a film, how purposefully everything is strung together. That's a great way to waste your time. Another one is keeping a journal. This is a very popular one too, but I would think it's one of the most noble. And I'll keep it simple with a quote by Anais Nin because I love her and because she was a famous, notorious diarist. She said to write was to live life twice, in the moment and in retrospection. I bet many of you would argue, as I kind of am in my own head right now, that keeping a journal is probably one of the most functional hobbies on this list. It kind of clears the mind, it organizes the details of your life, it improves your memory, encourages further speculation on the events that you have in your life. But either way, it is still done for the self and really for no one else. I mean, diaries are often private. You don't, you don't just write a diary entry and then go up to the nearest person that you see or, or who you know and you say, hey, read this. Diaries are private, they're secretive, and you're often your most honest. Diaries to me just kind of seems like one of the more trivial arts, but an art nonetheless, an art form of observation, an art form of speculation of simply just being able to recount everything in your day. How many times have you asked yourself, what did I do yesterday? Even if it was a great event that happened, we're losing our memories, really. We're not really living, a lot of us. So whenever you write something down in a diary, you're able to recall. It's almost like looking through pictures from the past that you took. It's probably one of the most private disciplines private art forms out there, keeping a diary. The last thing on this list is creating anything without the intent to sell, whatever it may be. Knitting, printmaking, sewing your own clothes, baking, photography, book binding, makeup, making zines, whatever. And I'll keep this short. If you do it simply because you enjoy it, if you do it for no other reason, I find great integrity and courage in that. In today's world where everybody is telling you to achieve something, to do something with purpose and meaning, and you're just saying, no, I do this for me, I don't do this for any kind of means to an end, then you're great. I feel like everyone should follow curiosities that lead them inwardly to find comfort in such a place, a place that a lot of people feel deterred from. I've also noticed that a lot of these hobbies or interests are kind of stylizations of something that could otherwise be functional. And in a way, it kind of reminds me of like a mutation, a kind of artistic mutation of something. I'll give one example here, such as food, fine dining. We need to eat. That's it. We need to eat for nourishment so that we can live, so that we can survive. That's all. But then fine dining adds and entirely mutates it. I'll say that. You have garnishes, you have plating, you have the literal act of arranging people around a table. It's almost ritualistic. The meal satisfies visually before it satisfies your hunger. I don't see anything more useless and ridiculous than that. Really, I made this video. I had this video idea some time ago, but it wasn't quite ready until this week. I'm just exhausted with the idea that if you do something, it should have a means to an end, that you should be getting somewhere with it, that those ends should be measured by something as silly as status or money or stability. This fixation with grandiosity and achievement that the masses has is a surefire way to make you hate anything that you do. With that kind of incentive, everything is done as a kind of way to stroke the ego. And while, sure, anything can be achieved in this way by using the ego as a tool, I, I think that we, don't, we should just maybe not fixate on that so much anymore. I'd say in today's world, we should kind of shift our focus onto those who achieve things in silence. 
leave them be, obviously, but like I said, there is great integrity and courage in those who achieve things quietly, whose happiness is solely derived from the act of creation and not what comes of it. Prioritization of process over result. It's kind of, it's like a selflessness. It's think of people who do a kind thing for somebody without expecting anything in return, right? That's one of the greatest things that you can experience in today's world. Somebody who sees you're sad at work, a total stranger, and they go out and they buy you a cup of coffee because they want you to feel better about your day and they don't expect you to buy them a cup of coffee. It's, it's, that, it's that same principle, to do something without witness, to do something without any ego. And weirdly, at the same time, it is incredibly self-concerned. I just think those people, those the hobbies that they pursue in silence, I think that they just shouldn't be looked down upon as much. But anyway, this is probably one of my longer videos and I'm going to end it here. Please do not forget to like and subscribe as always. Please leave a comment. Please let me know what your useless hobbies are and I will see you guys next week. Goodbye.